Cool. So last time we were talking a little bit about uh, EDOS or protected density states. EDOS. And we started talking about charge and this thing called the overlap integral, where um, if we were looking at the overlap between uh, two atomic orbitals, we had to normalize that. And I think you guys already have this in your notes. But after you normalized it, you ended up getting coefficient 1 squared plus coefficient 2 squared plus 2 times C1, C2, S12. And S12 was that overlap integral. And we said, OK, this, this is equating to how much, um, how much these functions overlap with one another. And we had a bunch of different charges. We said, all right, charge is really difficult to quantify because there are multiple ways to assign charge. Now, how does this relate to the uh, projected densities of states? So just like we did in this problem, we wanted to, or at least John was talking about showing like where the PX was or the PY was, we want to be able to tease out those individual orbital contributions to the total projected density of the world. So, um, so this analysis, a charge analysis, is utilized in the PDOS. As it is applied, to the total DOS. Okay. So we've already shown what the PDOS looks like, but let's say we have another system. Um, I don't know, a completely fictitious system where we just have an S orbital and a PX orbital and they're, they're in a chain and we only have sigma type bond. So, We're going to have k along there, 0 to pi over a, e, and we're going to have 2, what, a 2s, and we'll have a 2px. And those are the only two atomic orbitals we have in our system. Again, this is completely fictitious, but that's what we're going to go with. All right, so let's try and plot out the total DOS. Okay, what's the DOS going to look like for this 2S system? Same. As usual, <laughs> yeah. so it's gonna go at the bottom. It'll mm -hmm. spike. Yeah, right. Yep. Yep. And these points, it's gonna be the highest because there's the most number of states in a really narrow energy window, right? So we'll get another one point like that. And what's the px gonna look like? Exact same. Yeah, the exact same thing. And notice these heights will be the same. Okay, because each of these can hold two electrons, so the number of states should be the same if we integrate on the end. Okay, now if we were to do the projected densities of states of the 2s, so we'll put the 2s in red. So if we were to plot the projected densities of states of the 2s, how would that look? We'll do. This is just a legend to show 
What color is what? Will it just be the same? Yep. What can you be a little more explicit than that? Um, you're just gonna have uh, the bottom portion. Okay. Yep, so the projected density as the states will go right over the top because that's the one for the contribution of that 2S. Now let's say we wanted to color the That will be for the two PX. What am I going to do with that one? Outline the other one. Yeah. Okay. So that way you can look at it and you can say, all right, which one's contributing to this portion of the band? Which portion is contributing to that part of the band? So you could tell what contributions were anti-bonding or would, are less favorable, which ones are more favorable. Okay. Um, let's say I we had another system that was almost the same way. Can you go back up for the definition real quick? Yep. Does that that work okay? Uh, a, little, a little bit out, a little bit up the that the other type. All right. Oh, wait, which way? This way or this way? The, the writing that you had. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to ask a question. What if we had two bands instead of just one at this point? So we're going to draw another, another band structure in a moment. So on your papers, make sure to do another plot where we have E and K. All right, I'm all good. Okay. We're gonna have another plot like this. E, and then we're gonna look at the DOS again. Energy. And what we're going to do, we'll have one here, and we'll say that's for an S orbital. And then let's say we were plotting one where there are two degenerate bands. There's a uh, two L's, two P Y, two P Z. And we're going to pretend that we don't have a PX. How's the density of the states going to look for the two S? The two S? Yep, the same as it did with the two PX. Yeah. Okay. What about this band? Or these bands, excuse me. What would their PDOS look like? Same thing again. Yeah. What about its height, though? It would be twice the height. Yep, it should be twice the size because we have two bands there. So it should be about double the size. Of that 2S. Now let's say we do the projected density as the states thing again. We got the 2S. We got the 2P. Do I have another color? I had a green earlier. More baby blue, purple. Oh yeah, we got purple. Best color ever. Okay, and we'll do, oh, that was 2PX, or Y, I'm sorry, 2PY. And then we have 2PZ. OK, where is our 2S going to be? The same? Yeah, the same, because if we project no. that out, it should be right over the top of this guy. OK, what about 
the two E Y. Over the top. Just gonna be like half, but you yeah, have yeah. to account for the drop also. Should be half of this guy. Should match, it should almost mirror this 2S. Okay, what about the the 2PY? The remainder. I'm sorry, what was that, Maddie? The remainder of the other one. It's not the full remainder because that would be if we were projecting out all of the 2P P, uh, orbitals. So, Josh, I think you're right. You said it should just be right here. It should just match. Okay, now, like if we did what Maddie said and we were to look at the total, total, we got green, Ooh. American flag, I don't know. Why. Right. Um, if we were to do, let's just say we were to do 2P, where would the projected density as a states be? If we weren't being descript about the, the individual orbitals. Would it be that whole top one would be yep. highlighted? That would be this whole thing. Okay, does that make sense? So total the P's Z, where this? is that at? The PZ is in that, that purple line that we drew. It should be right on top of the 2PY because they have so the same. Equivalent. Yep, they're equivalent. They're Because in this Makes case, sense. they're completely degenerate. Josh, okay. you had something? Um, so this green is the total PDOS of the PXY orbital? Yep, it's just of the 2P orbitals. Mm -hmm. So not including PX or including right in, in this in this system we don't have a PX. Okay. It it's fictitious. Normally you would, but in this case we don't. I just wanted to do that so I drove home the point of those projected densities of states. Okay. All right. This can still give us a bit of inf chemical information, but there's another thing that we can look at. Um, called uh, the the coop or the cohop, and it stands for a crystal orbital overlap populations. We're only going to talk about the coop, but there's another one called uh, the COHP, uh, which stands for Crystal Orbital Hamiltonian Populations, and it works a bit better, but it's it's more complicated to explain. So we're going to just stick with this coop. Okay. Um, so we've talked about electrons and bonds. But so, or we've talked about electrons and bands, but we really haven't talked much about like the bonding nature of these bands. But we have made no mention of where the bonds are. And the cool thing is, is these coops or COHPs can. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the simplest system we have. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Too. We're gonna jump back to the 1D hydrogen chain. Let's consider The 1DH chain again. Oops, 1DH chain. Okay, so we have our hydrogens in a row. Our first one we're going to label hydrogen one, 
second one hydrogen two, fourth one hydrogen four. I skipped three for some reason. I don't know. I don't like threes. Odd numbers suck. Wait, wait, Maddie, your your family does. What's the number your family does? Five. Five. I'm sorry. Odd number is. <laughs> don't suck. Five's cool. The rest of them. Okay. Five is different. <laughs> The worst number, 47. Hate that number. I feel like 25 is a good number. 25, you, oh yeah, 25 is a good number. <laughs> numbers by fives are like different. Yeah. I, I think it's weird that humans can process numbers by five way faster than they can process like other, other digits. Like why is five? Is, is it just, it just because? because a zero or a five at the end. Yeah, but I mean, like, it's like a zero and a one. Like, it's it's just on and off. Yeah, it's just funny. Like, you would think like maybe like aliens on another planet, threes are a big thing. Like, they count by threes <laughs> rather than fives. <laughs> I think about aliens way too much lately. I need to get out and see people. <laughs> <laughs> He's going crazy in his house. <laughs> Nothing new. <laughs> okay, so let's draw our main structure. We got K. What are the limits for K again? Zero and pi over A. Yep, zero pi over A. We got energy. And what's the band structure of this system look like? For, for a 1D band. hydrogen chain. Just a one S band. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now we're going to try it. We're going to have another point over here. We're going to have our block functions, like what they look like. We're going to keep track of the interaction of hydrogen one and hydrogen two. And we're going to keep track of the interaction of hydrogen one and hydrogen three. It'll make more sense in a minute as we go along. Okay. Down here, what do the block functions look like? Like if we had, these are the centers of our atoms. What am I going to draw around them? Circles. Yeah, because they're all in phase with one another. So what's the interaction between hydrogen one and hydrogen two? Bonding, anti-bonding, non-bonding. Bonding. Yep, bonding. What about for hydrogen one and hydrogen three? Bonding. Yep. Okay, let's do another, the top of the band. What does the top of the band look like? Out of phase, every other one. Really out of phase. So like this, right? Sign changes between these two guys, no there, no there. Completely anti-bonding um, if we're looking across these. Now what, what type of interaction between one and three is there? Or excuse me, one and two is there? Anti-bonding. Anti-bonding. Yeah. What about hydrogen one and hydrogen three? Bonding. Yeah, bonding. Okay, now let's look at the center of the road. If you, there's a couple different ways you could plot those block functions. We had two degenerate ways, right? We had one where we could have had it look like, sorry, we'll all move that up in a second. One where we could have it where they were colored that way or one where it was like that, right? If we slap these two together, what's it gonna look like? They all black with the first one. So this one, yep, they're gonna, they're, it's gonna be the same color for that one. This one, what happens to it? Since we <sighs> So this one has one that's colored in, this one has one that's not. What happens when these two interact with each other? They would not bond. 
Yeah, they're not bond, they just phase out. So there'd be no contribution there. What about for number three, what happens? They bond. So it's yeah. already. And number four? They not bond. Yeah, no. yeah, they're out of phase, destructive interference, no contribution there. So we can express these two as this guy. So that's what we're going to do up here. So we have one, nothing, negative, nothing. What type of interaction is it between atom one and atom two? Non-bonding. Yep, non-bonding. What about atom one and atom three? Anti-bonding. Yep. Okay. Am I all right to move this up? Yeah. So now back to this poop thing and determining like bonding and anti-bonding. The, the crystal orbital overlap populations uh, uses the overlap density. So that's related to that S integral we were talking about last time and the sign of the overlap integral. that S12 thing we were talking about for, for a two, actually I should, in a two centered bond. Our two centered case uh, to determine if the pairwise interaction is bonding anti-bonding or non-bonding okay so basically we use this this co-op it's another plot that we do and it tells us do we have a bonding non-bonding or anti-bonding at this certain point but we have to look at, you have to have certain fragments to, to investigate that. Like you wanna know how does uh, atom one interact with atom four in the chain? You wanna know how atom one interacts with atom two in the chain, and so on. Uh, to describe some of the mechanics that are used, if the orbital coefficients which was C1 and C2 are the same sign. And the overlap integral that S12 is positive. The so orbital coefficients are the same sign. The overlap integral is positive. What type of interaction is this going to be of the three we have listed? I know, a lot to scramble down, sorry. <laughs> so what interaction is it going to be? It's going to be bonding, anti-bonding, or non-bonding? Bonding. Probably bonding. Yep, same sign. Overlap integral is good. This means a bonding interaction. What about if the opposite is true? If coefficients are of opposing signs. What happens in that case? Anti-bonding. Yep. Blue to purple. Because I found that I have one. Ooh, color. Makes it more interesting, right? Okay. 
So something to make note of. You have to state what interactions you're looking at, what, what um, pair of atoms you're considering. So you must state which pair of atoms you are considering in your hoop. Okay, that'll make more sense in a minute. For our first example, what we're going to do, we're going to consider um, the, the H2 molecule, look at its DOS band structure and group. Okay, so consider H2 molecule. So in this case, we have a 1D hydrogen chain, but the distance. We have between adjacent molecules is infinite. It's huge. Okay, let's plot our band structure. That's A. Zero pi over A, K, E. What's the band structure going to look like for a molecular system? Molecular system? Would there be molecular? No, it's just a tonic orbital band still, right? Yep, yeah, not really bands, right? So, well, oh, you're saying individual orbital bands? Like it's not a continuum of states, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so it's not a continuum of state because that would be a band, right? Solid. So what's it gonna look like for this? A line? Yeah, and how many lines? Uh, one, two, two. two. There's a body one and here body. and one here. Because we have two, we have two atomic orbitals What's this guy down here? If you had to draw it out for a molecular system. Sigma bond. Yep, that's our sigma. What's this guy? Sigma star. Yeah. Okay, let's plot the DOS. What's the DOS gonna look like? Is it also just a line? I'm sorry, what'd you say, Josh? Is it also just a line? Also a line, Woo, one there. Well, it's it's like a delta function. There's a little bit there, but it basically will look like a line. Yep, and again, this one's to the sigma star. That one's to the sigma. Now, the coupe, we have to plot it a little bit differently. We're gonna have COOP, we're going to indicate which atoms we're looking at. So we're looking at hydrogen one and hydrogen two. This goes to the negative end, there's a negative. This end goes to the positive. This indicates the bonding orbitals. This one indicates the anti bonding. And it's basically like a DOS that just changes sign based upon if it's bonding or anti-bonding. Should it be like a half and half, like even like a yeah. uh, Okay, I, I just make yeah. sure. <laughs> yep. There are mock my art. See how <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it should be halfway through. This should look like a rectangle and that line's halfway through. Oh yeah, it's a cure aid. Okay. <laughs> I can we tell to... your heart is broken. We have to have a plot for this this DOS. What's it gonna look like in the in the the coop? 
going to be bonding. Yep, it's just going to be on the bonding side. Hey, doctor. Sorry, that's meant to be a line. Screwed that up. <laughs> what about that? I, I felt so self-conscious to Josh judging me in the entire <laughs> What about what about for this guy? Anti <laughs> yeah, anti-bonding. There we go. Line that way. So what you could do is is let's say we didn't have any chemical information, like we didn't know um we didn't know much about like this density as a state. We could look at this group and we could see, okay, it's anti-bonding here, bonding across that. So it gives us more chemical information. Now, where's the Fermi level going to be in all of these drawings? Middle. Yep, the middle. So EF, EF, EF. Okay. Everyone feel comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move to um, the 1D hydrogen chain then. Am I okay to move this? Yeah. Yeah. So let's look. Example 1D H chain. And we're going to look at. Uh, Two, we're going to look at two um, coops. We're going to have coop one, where we're looking at hydrogen one and hydrogen two. And we're going to have coop two, where we're looking at hydrogen one and the interaction of hydrogen three, because we've got track of those things. OK. We've got a first plotter band structure, 0 pi over a. A, E. Okay, let's plot this out. Looks like that, right? We got DOS and energy. All right, what is our DOS going to look like? All right, usual thoughts. I, Tara's Navy SEAL hand signals gave it away. <laughs> that little, little demon horns. Okay. Next, we're going to plot out the, the coop. Oh, God. Negative, positive, anti-bonding. We got bonding. So we're going to show the interaction of, let's see, H1 and H2. And then we're going to do another line for H1 and H3. Let's, let's first plot the, looking at the orbital interactions of one and two. So let's hop back to what we drew earlier, where we were drawing those block functions. And let's consider where we want our points. So we care about one and two in this case. So we're going from a bonding to non-bonding to anti-bonding, right? Okay, so what should the plot look like for, for H1 and H2 in the, the crystal orbital overlap populations? Would it be the same as the H2 molecule? Not, yep, it's gonna it's gonna go up as a positive sign, like at, at that point right along there, right? Because the density is the states, it's going up that way. 
Now, what's going to happen as we continue to go up our band? So what happens to the bonding character as we move up in our band? <laughs> I don't know if saw that, but <laughs> your bonding character diminishes. Yeah, your bonding character here. is going to go down. <laughs> Just like we drew in here, we went from bonding, non-bonding, to anti-bonding. So what's going to happen? Where should I draw this line? <laughs> Or what this line indicates a non-bonding situation, right? Where is the most non-bonding character in this band? At pi over a. No, that, that's anti-bonding, right? Yeah, uh, so there will, there will be a right point in the right along here, and then there's gonna be a point in the dead center. So what it should look like is that. And these two sides, they should be symmetric to one another. Okay, now what about H1, H3? We talked about what type of interactions they're going to have. We're going to start with bonding, we go to anti bonding, then back to bonding again, right? Now, this keeps track of the strength of the interaction. Which interactions are going to be stronger? The interaction between one and two or one and three one and three. One and three. They're gonna have more overlap, orbital I overlap. I don't know, I give up. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Due to proximity, I'm guessing that one and yep. two will have longer interaction. Yeah. So we're talking about just proximity. The closer these orbitals are to one another, the more effective the overlap, right? So one and three are going to have a smaller amount of overlap, a smaller amount of dispersion compared to one and two. So whatever we draw here should be a little bit less, or it should be less than what we drew for H1 and H2. So we said we have a bonding interaction. What this will look like This is a rough sketch. <laughs> We're doing anti bonding. So bonding like that. So I'm going to try and color that in a little bit more. Do they connect in the same spot, or is it actually just a little bit lower? They should. They should connect in the same spot. I just wanted to drop oh. it. Call him out again, John. Like there. Yeah. <laughs> me last time. Last time was you, <laughs> John. Yeah, no. I <laughs> if, you, if you look in the Hoffman book that I sent, there's a better picture, a better representation. I think it looks great. Well, thank you. That builds my confidence. <laughs> it conveys oh, yeah. what it needs to. So, yeah. Are there any questions about that? Well, this can give you good chemical information in solids, knowing where things are bonding, where they're anti-bonding. So we would know, um, know like if we wanted to break a bond in a solid, how could we do that? How to populate these systems? Okay. If you were doing one H or H1 and H4, would it look the same as H1 and H2? Uh, let's look at that. So these are the block functions, right? Oh, there is no We're looking at H1 and H4. It yeah. would look almost the same, but what would the difference be? So it's going to look almost like H1 and H2, but what's the major difference going to be? I don't know. The I distance don't between the two? Me. Yep, the distance between the two. So what does that mean about the overlap? Mm, not as, yep, oh. not as much overlap, so it's going to be almost mirrored, but it's not going to go up as high. Um. So that will be H1, H4. Good question. Okay. 
Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. So how are we doing on time? We got some time. Okay, we're going to switch gears and we're actually going to start talking about solids, like the, the physical structure of solids. Um, I was hoping we could do this in person because it's a bit easier to do in person so we can look at three dimensional models. However, I'm going to put something in the chat. Some, however, I do that. There we go. More chat. Okay. What happened? Yeah, actually, it's there are a couple. Oh, I'm pressing enter on a keyboard that's not plugged in. <laughs> there we go. I'm a doctor. There we go. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna send these two, and I'm gonna share my screen. Um, new share. Basic. Let's see. Screen two. Can everybody see my screen too, right now? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So um, there are a bunch of different ways to organize atoms in a solid, and we have to talk about those ways to organize them. Uh, there are two, two bigger points to talking about how these things are oriented. There are Bravais lattices, which are kind of like a, a larger structure, and then there is something called space groups which are a lot like point groups, um, but we'll, we'll get into that. So we're gonna talk about the actual organization of like these atoms in a unit cell and what a unit cell is. So we'll get back to that stuff in a minute. But let's talk, and we'll look at some cool MC Escher drawings too. So uh, this is related to chapter seven in your book, chapter seven, the solid state. And there are basically, well, come on, two types of crystals that we have, two classifications of solids. We have crystals, And we have amorphous solids. Crystals. So what's the difference between a crystal and an amorphous solid? Anybody have an idea? Or what does the word amorphous mean? Not uniform. Yep, non-uniform, so not ordered. Very limited symmetry. Whoa, geez, let's try that again. Or limited symmetry. What about crystals? Ordered with symmetry. Yeah. So um, they have a lot of order. Ordered, lots of symmetry in some cases. And they have repeat units. So for the remainder of this chapter, what we're going to do is, is we're going to focus on crystals. So let's start talking about the unit cell. You guys might remember this from general chemistry, but this is a repeat unit. In a solid. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's go back to this screen for a minute. And so everybody can see this lattice, right? Let's try and full screen it. Oh, that did, that was great. It moved so much bigger. Um, this is an example of a crystal lattice where the, the not colored in cube 
is like a periodic solid that's extending out for infinity, whereas we can draw a repeat unit with this colored in box along here. So that's in this colored in box is an example of a unit cell. If we copied that and moved that anywhere, we would get that same image over and over again. You guys know, oops. Uh, who MC Escher was? He was an artist. Yeah. Yeah, he was an artist and he did tessellations. He was uh, friends with MC Hammer, right? Yeah, exactly. They, they wore they wore those big pants together. They rocked it out. So let's find which one's everyone's favorite on here right now. Any votes? The fish, yeah. little Pegasus. Let me see. The Pegasus. The little squid things on the left. Oh, well, I vote for the lizard guys. The lizard yeah. king. Squid. Lizards. Yeah. Any other votes for lizards? Lizards are fine. Cool. <laughs> right, lizards are fine. Why not? Lizards are weird. I don't know. We'll go. We'll go with. I don't know. What are these? Are they bugs? Meeny, meeny, miny, mo. Yeah. Like Pick a number between one and five. Yeah, we'll go. We're gonna go with these ones because it's a bit easier. We're gonna go with the Pegasus. Yeah. Right, we'll <laughs> nope. Not what I wanted. I'll go with that. I want bigger. Oh, that helped. <laughs> Just another whole site. Fine. We'll see. We'll do wallpaper. I didn't mean it literally. Okay, background. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looks like we're gonna. We'll go with bunnies. So you can see in this picture. Um, th this orange one is colored in, and that's showing us um, what, what's being repeated throughout the system. That's not actually what the unit cell of this system would be, though. Uh, let's say that, that that rabbit was not orange. What would the unit cell be for this system? Like, I don't know. Blue and a combination of the two rabbits together. Yeah, so it would be like going from, let's say, this point to an eye of a blue one, back to that eye of a blue one. Yeah. Like that. And what um, would happen is, is there would be a blue rabbit and a green rabbit contained in that same unit cell, right? Okay, what about, I don't know, we'll go back. We'll pick, I don't know, let's look at swans. That one's almost the same. Where would you pick a unit cell in this one? You could do it from anywhere. You could do it for the beaks. Yeah, you could do it from the beaks. You could go from beak to beak, as long as it's the same, the same colored crane or whatever. Do we have to pick beaks? Where else could we pick? Tail to tail. Yeah, you could do tail to tail. You could literally pick anywhere as long as you go to that same point. OK. But what you notice is, is that shape is maintained no matter what, whatever point that you pick, right? So even in this, this crystal, wherever we pick, we could pick like that atom, we could pick that atom, but as long as we keep continuing it and replicating that system, we get a good crystal. Uh, let's pick another one. Let's pick a, I don't know, let's go with tetragonal. Is it going to update for me? There we go. Eh, that doesn't look too, too different. Let's see. Aye, right, there we go. That's one. Oh, but my unit cell is freaking out. <laughs> well, you can see here, where would you draw a unit cell for this three-dimensional system? <laughs> Oh, there we go. There it is. <laughs> Never mind. Right. It's giving it away. This <laughs> must blue to a uh, white. Yep. So if you look in this one, there's there's two sets of unit cells we could go, but symmetry they're they're symmetrically they're equivalent to one another. But there are two descriptive unit cells we could go. With, right. Everyone feel comfortable with that? Okay. 
let's go back to our notes. Okay, so we got a leafy unit and a solid uh, symmetry is noted via space groups. So these are like point groups, but they're a bit different. What makes a point group? Uh, or like a combination of symmetry things. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of symmetry. What operations should be performed for the matrix? Mm -hmm. Yep, you do, you do some operations, it messes with the matrix. There is specifically one thing that doesn't change in a point group. What doesn't change in a point group? Inversion center. Uh, inversion <laughs> centers can be moved around and stuff. So let's say we look at each two. What doesn't change is what you said? Yep, what doesn't change? The principal axis. The principal axis, yep. well, principal axis doesn't move or rotate, right? Yeah. Specifically, if we look at H or H2O, there's one point in the dead center that doesn't change throughout all of the symmetry operations. So in a point group, there's one point that does not change. What's going to happen with a space group? Can you have multiple lattice points? You can have multiple lattice points, yep. It's the spacing, the spacing within those atoms that doesn't change. OK. Um, so we keep track of these through a bunch of symmetry operations like we would point groups. Now, there are a total of 230 space groups. Would that be on the next test? Yep, exactly. On the next test, you have to know how many point groups. You have to know this many space groups. Are you kidding? I am completely kidding you. I wouldn't expect that. Oh my god. <laughs> god I'm good. You would exactly. believe that, Tara. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now imagine that flow chart. Like we drew one out for. <laughs> yeah. So we had to know. We had to know a significant number of these in my graduate level course. We, we don't have to know any of them for this class. Just know that they exist. Okay. We're going to do something a little bit easier. Uh, it is easiest. To identify the broad base lattice. Before identifying the specific space group. The benefit to this is, is there are only 14 Bravais lattices. These you do have to know though. Okay. So in the chat, I think I sent a picture of those Bravais lattices along with that Wolfram Alpha thing where you could manipulate them. Let's just look at them for a second. So these are the Bravais lattices. You notice there are three cubic, two tetragonal, handful of orthorhombic, hexagonal, monoclinic, triclinic. What makes these okay. things different from one another? The bond length, lengths of like A, B, and C, and then the bond angles. Yep, exactly. So the angles between the atoms and the distance between the atoms. Which of these looks the most symmetrical to you? Like of the of the four, or excuse me, one, two, three, four, five, six, of the six, oh, seven. The seven seven crystal classes. So which looks the most symmetric to you? It's the, the cubic primitive, right? Yeah. 
I'd say cubic. Cubic looks the most symmetrical to me. Some people might argue it's hexagonal. Um, which one has the worst possible symmetry? Last one. Yep, the last one, triclinic. And most crystals are actually triclinic. This makes it very difficult, like when you're doing x-ray diffraction to try and identify crystal structures because it doesn't have a lot of symmetry in there. And what you're trying to do is use math to look at how those x-rays are bouncing off or uh, neutrinos are bouncing off to get a crystal structure. So um, there are, are four types of unit cells. There are seven crystal lattices. This leads to a total of 14 broad bases. Okay. So you have to be able to identify like which ones are cubic, which ones are tetra tetragonal, and so on based upon the shape of these unit cells. Okay. Let's hop back to our notes. So things we have to know to determine our broad base lattice. We got to know what things do we have to know? Linkert. Uh, nope, don't have to worry about, well, you could know symmetries. That can help. We don't Distance have to know atoms. Yep, you have to know how many atoms in unit cell. That's something we have to keep track of. What else do we have to know? Positions and angles. Yep, angles. And uh, we have to know unit cell lengths. So you have to consider those things in order to get that. Okay. Um, let's talk about co-crystals. Actually, we'll talk about close pack structures first, then we'll talk about co-crystals. Co-crystals are way cooler than a lot of this stuff. Um, so, uh, close packed structures. So there are two ways you can organize like hexagonal systems. Or hexagonal closed packed HCP, and you have cubic closed packing CCP and face centered. cubic packing. FCP. And just like a stanza in a poem, they have different like organizations to them, different stackings. Let's look at closed pack. Crystal. Mm, that one. All right. Except I want an image. Sorry. Give me a second. Here we go. So all you really have to know about these, am I sharing the right screen? So if you look, um, there's, as we repeat these unit cells, what happens is, is they build on top of one another. And if we're looking at a metal surface, there are a couple different ways it can be organized. It can be organized in this ABC stacking pattern or this ABA stacking pattern. And these tend to be the lowest in energy for um, many solids to be organized this way. So like for example, if you get a lot lattice of copper, silver, or gold, they'll form one of these, these stacking patterns. In fact, it happens to be 
depending on what cut of the surface you look at, it ends up being like this type of organism. So if we go back to our notes, all you really have to know is, is the type of stacking that pattern that these guys have. So hexagonal close pack, they tend to have an A and B A stacking where it's just a repeat of that symmetry. Whereas the cubic close packing, the base center close packing, it's A, B, C type packing. Okay. All right, are there any questions about that? No? Read through your book, check to make sure that you have an understanding of what these structures look like. So no, so it's it's book, not the regular, regular book. What's that? This is our, our regular book. The Hoffman book doesn't okay. have much about it. What were you saying, Josh? Uh, so no flow chart for Labrador's lattices. We just gotta look at them in the book. Yep, just know like cubics, cubics have a 90, like the best thing to know are those angles. So like back in this, this plot where you had the cubic structures, their lengths are all the same and they all have a 90 degree angles, heterogonal, one of the bond lengths or one of the unit cell lengths is not equal to the other two, but the angles are remaining the same. That type of information is what you'll see. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, let's look at uh, co-crystals. Co-crystals are pretty cool. So depending on who you talk to, there's a variable definition. There's no agreed upon uh, definition, I think, for a co-crystal, but it's basically two or more molecular entities or at least this is how I describe it. That form a crystal. So examples of these, you know, you know some of them. Um, hydrates. So can anyone tell me what a hydrate is, or do you have an example of a hydrate? A lot of salts tend to have water trapped inside the crystal lattice. So yeah, like copper to sulfate hydrate. Yeah. I helped someone with a gen chem lab. That's why I remember that. <laughs> and do you remember how many waters were there? It was five. So, so the name of this guy was copper to sulfate. Five. Do you remember what else? Mm. And like dot five or something like that. Sulfate. Oh, never mind. Here. And then there's something hydrate. What number do we uh, need? What's I whatever need. five is. Penta. <laughs> there you go. So hydrates are kind of cool because they incorporate water into their crystal lattice, but they're it's it's not permanently bound there. So how do you get the water to come off this hydrate? Um, an oven, so like heating. The oven, you heat, and what happens is, is you get that copper sulfate out. Oh, not aqueous, I'm sorry, that's a solid. And that would be considered anhydrous copper to sulfate. And then you'd get five water gases. So the way I describe this to people is, is it's like a classroom. Uh, the, the seats are there, the students move in, they sit down. When the class is done, the students leave. The, wa the water molecules and the students are similar where they, they leave this architecture behind, but the, the structure is still there. The seats are there, the chair is still there, so that lattice is still there. Actually, most desiccants are used for this. Like, so if anybody has a safe or a gun safe, you usually throw desiccants in there. That's what these things are actually comprised of. Does anybody know, like experimentally, um, how do you know this interaction has occurred? Um, it's accompanied by color change to the transition yeah. metal complex. Yep. 
So in transition metal complexes, I'm going to show. Oops. Tell me I need to shut up. I'm excited about hydrates. Can't ever <laughs> shut me up. All right. So this is an example along here where the blue is the hydrated salt and the, the kind of powdery white form is the anhydrous form. So you can actually see some physical like color changes from this. All right. Now, um, we also have clathrates, which are pretty cool. That was one of the topics the seniors could choose to pick and no one did <laughs> for one of their talks. And these are where you have, yeah. Does anybody know about these at all? Or so basically, it's it's like a co-crystal where you have um, a molecular entity trapped in the crystal of the other. We're gonna find so an example of this is at the bottom of the C. There are clathrates that contain methane. And so you can actually get flammable ice from this. It's pretty cool. One second, I'll share it with you. I don't know if you'll be able to hear the sound, but you can at least see the stuff get lit on fire. This is this is like a demo I really want to do at some point. Can everybody see this side of my screen? Yep. Yeah. Still see it? No. Yeah. Okay. So So what happens is, is the methane actually gets trapped in the crystal lattice of the ice, and then you can light the ice on fire. Just cool. So, okay, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So th it's pretty cool. They can actually like there. There's a lot of applications for these things, um, but I think that's one of the the neatest. Oops, stop sure. I think that's one of the neatest things to see in terms of these crystal lattices. You have these two entities that are trapped in one another and you get properties that could be desirable. So there you go. So are there any questions about co-crystals at all? So like what's the difference between like a diamond that's a different color um, and like these? Is that because it's actually replacing one of the unit cell atoms? Yes, or, or, or there's an impurity in these glasses. Oh, okay, so yeah. it's still kind of be following the same lattice structure, but it's just like swapping something out. Yep, and that's actually like oh, okay. N and P dopants when you talk about electronics too. They're usually they're either introducing impurities or they're replacing one of the atoms in the unit cell. The other big spot I forgot to mention for co-crystals is pharmaceuticals. There's big money in predicting or knowing what co-crystals are. Because a lot of times in terms of patents, you have mixtures of drugs together. And if you have a crystal structure, that's an easy way to patent. So an example of this is, is there was a, an AIDS treatment drug that um, they patented the wrong crystal structure for. And the courts ruled that, this, that their patent didn't apply. They lost literally billions of dollars from it. So, Know your cold crystals if you ever go to do a pack. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, all right. Are there any questions in general?